So now we will see The Empire Strikes Back, Part 3. And we're going to continue looking at how Hitler sparked the war. In the years leading up to the start of World War II, Germany, led by the Nazis, had regained virtually all its lost land taken in the Great War, stabilized its economy, initiated the goal of eliminating the Jewish population, and achieved all this with the rest of the world sitting on the sidelines. The British and French leaders at the Munich Conference attempted to appease Hitler by allowing Germany to retain the lands it had retaken by force, hoping to avert a greater conflict. As we will see, this appeasement at Munich was nothing short of an abject failure. In 1939, a series of unchecked aggressions emboldened the Germans to continue to expand. Beginning in March, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia and Lithuania, and in April, the Italians invaded Albania across the Adriatic Sea. While members of the League of Nations talked a great deal, they took no overt action. In August, the Nazi-Soviet Pact was signed. This was a non-aggression treaty, not an alliance. It was a guarantee of non-belligerence between Germany and the Soviet Union. They also divided up Eastern Europe between them into spheres of influence, anticipating they would eventually officially annex them. Now, both parties knew this was not a lasting arrangement, and there was no love lost between them, but it benefited both sides. Germany could focus its attention on France and avoid another two-front war, and the Soviet Union gained time to build up its industries and armies. Hitler claimed that the city of Danzig and the Polish Corridor had been torn from the Fatherland, and on September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. This is largely considered to be the beginning of World War II, because of an alliance the Poles had with the British and French. The Axis powers knew of this alliance, and they were fully prepared to fight another all-out war. The British and French declared war on Germany on September 3rd, two days after the invasion of Poland. It took the Allies months to adequately mobilize their troops for battle, so people started referring to this as a phony war, since Britain and France were not yet fully engaged in the hostilities. Nonetheless, in the spring, there was plenty of fighting going on, and the Axis powers experienced nothing but victory. The Germans had already expanded into Eastern Europe, as did the Soviets, and in April of 1940, Germany invaded Norway, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. In May, the Germans invaded France. Now, the Maginot Line did somewhat work as the French had hoped. The Germans avoided the most heavily fortified areas, but they followed a different invasion plan than the French had anticipated and plowed through the Ardennes Forest, and the Battle of France had begun. So you can see the old Schlieffen plan, and you can see where the French were expecting them to be able to fight because they would force them around the Maginot Line, but this is what the Germans did plowing through the Ardennes Forest. Now, technology had progressed dramatically, and the Germans used paratroopers to rapidly mobilize their troops deep into enemy territory. In this image, you see the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, flying over the Dutch countryside with paratroopers streaming from multiple aircraft. The Germans utilized a tactic the Allies referred to as the Blitzkrieg, meaning lightning war. They used radio to coordinate air and armored attack, with ground troops following closely behind. This military tactic overwhelmed the Allies. They were forced back and surrounded at Dunkirk, a French seaport along the English Channel. Fortunately for the Allies, Hitler and some commanders halted the Axis advance, afraid they were stretching their front lines too deeply and were susceptible to flanking attacks. The British quickly sent a flotilla of ships, military and non-combatant, to evacuate civilians and over 300,000 troops. The Allies were fortunate their losses weren't worse. However, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the UK, quickly reminded them wars are not won by evacuations. In early June, the Germans were aided by the Italians invading from the south, and on June 22nd, the French agreed to an armistice, formally withdrawing from the war as a formidable fighting force. Nazi Germany achieved in six weeks what Imperial Germany failed to do in four years during the Great War. And France was divided, with Vichy France in the south, an authoritarian government put into place under the oversight of Germany. This was a form of indirect rule, Keep in mind, Vichy France was no friend to the Allies, and many authorities also aided in rounding up Jews as well as other undesirables. In the north was occupied France, that was under the direct German control. This was essentially part of the German Empire, the Third Reich. In fact, by some accounts, the Germans produced more weapons of war in occupied France than in mainland Germany throughout World War II. By September of 1940, Germany controlled virtually all of the European mainland. 
and sweet dreams after seeing this image. General Charles de Gaulle had evacuated to London and formed the French underground, the Free French Movement. And another part of the French resistance was the Maquis, meaning scrubby undergrowth. All of these groups contributed to the war effort primarily through espionage, sabotage, and occasional guerrilla warfare. However, the French underground was never a formidable fighting force equipped to defeat the Axis powers. The only country that stood in the way of a complete Axis victory was the United Kingdom. And so began the Battle of Britain that went from August to November in 1940. It was a contest between air forces, pitting the German Luftwaffe against the Royal Air Force. This was necessary because Britain's Royal Navy was too powerful for the German Navy to stage an invasion without air superiority. The Luftwaffe targeted civilian centers, railroads, and industry. Hermann Goering, who led this engagement, was a devout Nazi, commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, and second-in-command to Hitler. If anything would have happened to him, Goering likely would have become the new Führer. While the Royal Air Force was outnumbered, their planes were more maneuverable. But what really won the day was the new detection system known as radar, meaning radio detection and ranging. Fortunately for the Allies, the Axis never fully developed this technology. The British built a series of early warning radar stations along the English coast in 1938 to detect approaching aircraft known as the Chain Home. Due to the use of radar and the bravery of the Royal Air Force, the Germans never gained air superiority and Operation Sea Lion was called off. This was the planned invasion of Britain. Churchill put it eloquently, stating, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. So now we'll finish off with a video of aerial and naval combat. While this footage is from the war in the Pacific later on, it will at least show you how far technology had come since the Great War.